It's hard to admit, but my situation is probably more complicated than most. I convinced myself I was fine, that I'd moved on. But last weekend, everything I thought I'd left behind just hit me like a freight train. The anger I thought was long buried suddenly came roaring back. And now, even though I'm home with my fiancé, I can't shake that bitterness towards my ex. The years I spent in anger management feel like they've been wiped away, all because of what she did and the mess she left behind. I really believed I was over it. I just turned 39 not too long ago. But this story goes back to when I was 18, when I met Samantha, my ex. At the time, I was deep into gang life with the Latin Kings. I'd been involved since I was 13, always in and out of trouble. But Samantha, she was the complete opposite. A church girl. I only ended up seeing her because my grandmother would drag me to Sunday, Massachusetts. The moment I laid eyes on her, I was hooked. Love at first sight or something like that. I asked my cousin, who happened to be friends with Samantha, to introduce us. He flat out refused. He didn't want me anywhere near her. Said I'd just mess up her life. In his words, he didn't want me to ruin her. Have you ever met someone who made you want to change everything about yourself, to be better than you are? That was her. When I found out she went to church nearly every day, I started hanging around, waiting for a chance to talk to her. I'd walk her to and from church, and for the first time in my life, I didn't feel like a complete screw-up. Before long, we started dating. I felt like my life was finally heading in the right direction. For about a year and a half, I pulled away from the gang, got my GED, started going to church regularly, and even started thinking seriously about my future. But just when I thought I'd left that life behind, I got dragged right back into it. One day, I was at a store and ran into someone I'd had problems with in the past. They started mouthing off, and I tried, I really did, to ignore it. I kept my head down and walked away. But then, out of nowhere, I got stabbed in the shoulder. That's when I lost it. I beat the guy so badly I got arrested. Just like that, all the progress I'd made disappeared. Samantha was furious. My grandmother kept reminding me of all my past screw-ups, and my cousin, he just said he knew I couldn't change. Luckily, my public defender saw I was trying to turn my life around, and by some miracle, I got out after a month in jail. Even though Samantha was still mad at me, she visited almost every day. A month after I got out, we found out we were gonna have a baby. That news hit me hard. I didn't want my kid to grow up with a father who was either dead or locked up. So, we eloped. I enrolled in trade school to become a mechanic and worked my ass off for my future family. But the day our daughter, Chloe, was born was almost the worst day of my life. Samantha had complications. She wouldn't stop bleeding. She went into shock, and the doctors had to perform a double hysterectomy. She was stuck in the hospital for months, and during that time, Chloe became my whole world. I was determined to give her the best life possible. When Samantha finally came home, I promised her our daughter would have a life far better than the ones we'd had. And for years, I kept that promise. I saved up enough money to move us out to the suburbs, we bought a house, and I even became a Girl Scout leader, believe it or not. I made sure Chloe went to private school, knew how to defend herself, and that I was the kind of husband I thought Samantha deserved. I had no role models growing up, never knew my dad, and had no positive male figures in my life. Honestly, I just copied what I saw from TV dads, trying to mimic those perfect families they showed. Years passed, and things seemed good. I owned my own garage, my cousin became a pastor, and my grandmother was still her usual self, always reminding me of my past mistakes. Samantha and I had a strong marriage, or so I thought. I even kept my prison body in shape. But Chloe, she hated me. Ever since she turned 13, it felt like everything I did irritated her. She didn't want hugs, rolled her eyes when I told her I loved her, and barely spoke to me. It tore me up inside, 
and Samantha saw it. But she just brushed it off, saying Chloe was a teenager and she'd grow out of it. She told me to give it time, that our daughter would come back around eventually. For two long years, I dealt with it, hoping things would change. So when her quinceanera came around, I wanted to make it perfect for her. I got everything she asked for, hoping it would show her how much I cared. But she still disrespected me at every turn. I'll admit, for a moment, the old me, the one I thought was gone, almost came back. I almost snapped just to put her in her place. But instead, I went to my cousin and vented about everything. He listened, prayed for me, and told me to just let her be. I still wanted to do something special for our father-daughter dance. I had this idea for a slideshow. I gathered up a bunch of old pictures of Chloe and me together for the slideshow. But it hit me hard when I realized I didn't have any recent ones. She just didn't want to take pictures with me anymore. The last ones I had of us smiling together were from her 13th birthday, and they were stuck on her old, broken tablet. I didn't care about the cost. I needed that tablet fixed. I went straight to a repair shop, handed it over, and after a day and three hundred dollars, the tech handed it back, good as new. I felt relieved, thinking I'd finally get my hands on those precious memories. I knew Chloe's passcode, but I'd never snooped through her stuff before. This time was different. I just wanted to retrieve those pictures. When I opened the tablet and went through the gallery, there they were. My little girl, smiling and happy to be with me. I felt a surge of pride and love, thinking about how things used to be. Then, out of nowhere, the instant messages started popping up. It was Chloe chatting with Samantha, my wife. The messages were about how Chloe didn't want to do the father-daughter dance with me at her quinceanera. But then, I saw the message that shattered my world. Chloe asked why she had to dance with me since I wasn't her real father. I swear, my heart stopped in my chest. My vision blurred, and I had to sit down because I felt like the ground had been ripped out from under me. My mouth went dry, and I couldn't breathe. Samantha responded, trying to defend me, saying that I raised her, that I loved her, and that made me her father. But Chloe wasn't having it. She texted back saying my cousin was her real father, and that she couldn't wait to turn 18 so she could tell me the truth and go live with him. She said she hated me and was thankful that I wasn't her biological father. Samantha lost it in the texts, cussing out Chloe and saying that it was a huge mistake for my cousin to have told her the truth two years ago. And as the conversation went on, the angrier I got. My wife had been lying to me for 15 years. My cousin, the man I trusted with my deepest fears and doubts, the one I turned to for advice on being a father, had been sleeping with my wife. And not only that, but I had unknowingly raised his child this whole time. The emotions hit me like a tidal wave. Anger, betrayal, grief. I wanted to scream, to cry, to hit something all at once. It was like every emotion possible collided inside me, and I didn't know what to do with it. To keep myself from doing something stupid, I told Samantha I needed to focus on work to pay for the quinceanera. Instead, I drove straight to Manhattan to see my old public defender. He wasn't just some low-level lawyer anymore. He had a successful, high-end firm now. I didn't expect him to remember me, but apparently, I was his very first case. We sat down and I laid it all out for him, everything that had happened. I even handed him the tablet. As soon as he turned it on, more messages kept pouring in. This time between Chloe and my cousin, her biological father. In the texts, he was trying to tell her to give me a chance, saying I had always been there for her. But Chloe wasn't buying it. She told him that he had been there for her too, and she called him Poppy over and over again during the conversation. He called her his little girl, and I could hardly believe what I was reading. My lawyer and I discussed our options, and he asked me what I wanted to do. I didn't hesitate. I told him I wanted to burn it all to the ground, go full scorched earth. He asked me again and again if I was sure, and each time I nodded. 
I wanted everything filed before the Quincianera. No exceptions. We spent the next 12 hours hammering out every detail of what needed to happen, and I followed his instructions to the letter. I quietly put my business up for sale, called the private school to tell them I wasn't paying for next year, closed the college fund and savings I had for Chloe, and started prepping to list the house for sale. No one knew a thing. I didn't slip up once, except for one detail, the day of the Quincianera. The party went off without a hitch. Everyone was there, and Chloe was smiling, enjoying herself. Samantha kept asking me if I was okay, and each time I lied. I'll admit it was hard to keep up the facade. I had never lied to her before, not once since the day we met. But for those two weeks leading up to the party, every time I kissed her, held her, or even made love to her, it took every ounce of restraint not to explode. I had to fight the urge to scream at her, to hate her for what she'd done, for making me raise another man's child. And not just any man, but my cousin, the man I trusted like a brother. He was the godfather of my daughter, the best man at our elopement, and the person I turned to whenever I felt lost. Suppressing that rage was a battle, to say the least, but I held it together until the father-daughter dance. When the time came, I called Chloe to the center of the stage. She looked annoyed but came over anyway. The music started, and she forced a smile at me, one I had been longing to see for years. But as soon as I saw it, I felt nothing but disgust. All those years I wanted her to smile like that again, but in that moment, I didn't want it anymore. As we danced, the slideshow began. Pictures of Chloe and me through the years, moments I thought were precious. Then, towards the end of the song, the mood shifted. I had included screenshots of her text messages with Samantha and my cousin. The truth was out there for everyone to see. It was chaos. Samantha's face went white as if she'd seen a ghost. Chloe just stood there, staring at the screen, completely frozen. And my cousin? He looked at me like a man who knew his time was up, petrified. Samantha rushed over, grabbing at me, desperate to explain herself. I didn't even flinch. I calmly told her that I'd already filed for divorce and she could explain everything to the judge. She clung to my arm, begging, but I pulled away. I turned to Chloe, told her I had worked my ass off to give her the world, but she no longer deserved it. Then I started walking out, but before I left, I told my cousin that from now on, every time I saw him, I'd knock him out. And I did right then and there, I decked him. The fallout was brutal. Samantha and Chloe moved in with my grandmother, but they didn't get much sympathy there. Her whole family was disgusted with her. They didn't want anything to do with her after the truth came out. Even her father, a man who never liked me despite all the changes I made in my life, apologized. He'd always seen me as the screw-up, but now, somehow, I was the perfect husband and father in his eyes. Just days earlier, he couldn't stand me, and now I was the one wronged. It was ironic, to say the least. My grandmother, though. She had the nerve to sit me down and tell me a Bible story about Isaac. How, when he returned from battle three years later, his wife had a one-year-old son, and he raised that boy as his own. She said I should be more like Isaac. I wasn't in the mood for any of it. I told her to get the hell out of my house. A few days later, Samantha came back, and the moment she saw me, she broke down crying. She swore up and down it was a mistake. She told me that when I got arrested, she was so angry at me and my cousin, of all people, was there to comfort her. One thing led to another, and they slept together. Just once, she claimed. She insisted she had been faithful ever since, and even offered to take a lie detector test to prove it. I didn't care. I asked her how long she knew Chloe wasn't mine, and the way she started crying harder told me all I needed to know. She had known from the beginning. I asked her to leave, but she kept pushing. She wanted to go to counseling, told me I was overreacting and that we could work it out. She said it was all in the past and that I just needed to move on. 
She kept insisting that I was Chloe's father no matter what, and that's when I lost it. I must have repeated get over it a dozen times, each time louder than the last, as I grabbed her things and threw them out the door. I told her I never wanted to see her face again, and that the life I built no longer belonged to her. Then I shoved her out and slammed the door behind her. Weeks passed, and Samantha wouldn't stop calling. But Chloe? Not a word from her. Samantha was furious when she found out I sold my business, and even more so when she discovered I had put our house on the market. One day, she barged into an open house, screaming at potential buyers, demanding they leave her home. She begged me to get help, saying I was destroying our marriage and had no right to sell the house where we had raised our child. I just looked at her and told her the truth, that the house was filled with lies. It was a place where I raised another man's child, and once it was sold, I'd give her half and be done with it. Then I ordered her to leave before I called the cops. I was bluffing, honestly. All she had to do was play the victim, and I would have been the one in handcuffs. But she didn't. She left. Not long after that, my cousin showed up, wanting to talk. I didn't give him the chance. I knocked him out, dragged him outside, and shut the door. I refused to even consider mediation. Samantha kept trying to get me to reconcile, but I was done. I wanted out, and my attorney made sure to push through a fast-track divorce. I wasn't going to spend another minute tied to that life of lies. In three months, we found ourselves in the Nassau County Courthouse. During that time, I kept mostly to myself, avoiding conversation with anyone. I'd read all kinds of horror stories about how divorce court can go, but thankfully, that wasn't my experience. I had a female judge who was fair and didn't let things get out of hand. My attorney handled everything like a pro. Samantha's lawyer tried bringing up my past, saying my gang affiliation somehow made me a bad husband or father, but my attorney shut that down quickly. The judge even reprimanded her lawyer, making it clear that my past didn't define who I became. I wasn't on trial for my mistakes. I was there as a man who had turned his life around. My attorney laid out all the evidence we had. He proposed a lump sum alimony payment, which would be funded by the sale of the house and my business. At first, Samantha kept begging me to reconsider, hoping I'd change my mind, but I ignored her. Once she saw I wasn't budging, she eventually agreed. But the real twist came when we got to the issue of child support. My attorney presented all the text messages between Chloe, Samantha, and my cousin. Proof that Chloe knew I wasn't her father and that she was eager to be with her real dad. She didn't want to live the lie any longer, and that hit hard. Samantha was completely blindsided. She had no idea that Chloe had said these things. Then my attorney dropped the bombshell, filing a motion to have my name removed from Chloe's birth certificate, to take my last name off her records, and to release me from any responsibility for child support. After all, it was clear to everyone that my cousin was her biological father. Samantha was beside herself, screaming at me, begging me not to do this to Chloe. She kept saying I was still her father because I raised her, and honestly, if Chloe hadn't acted the way she did, if she hadn't said those hateful things, I might have agreed. There were moments when I felt the pull to reach out, to maybe try and make it work. But every time I thought about it, I'd look back at those text messages, Chloe's conversations with her friends, with her real father, and with Samantha, and it brought me right back to reality. To this day, I still don't know what hurts more, being betrayed by the woman I thought was the love of my life, or being tossed aside like garbage by the child I devoted my life to, the child I tried to give everything to. The judge sat there quietly for a long time, reading through the text messages. I could see the weight of it on her face. Finally, she agreed with my attorney. I wasn't responsible for Chloe anymore, and my name could be removed from her birth certificate. My attorney then took it a step further, filing a motion to have the court pursue my cousin for child support. He also filed a civil suit against my cousin to recover all the money I spent raising Chloe. Every cent that went to private schools, dance classes, 
Girl Scouts, horseback riding, you name it. My attorney argued that my cousin had committed fraud by allowing me to unknowingly raise his child without offering a single dime of support. It was a long shot, but the judge agreed. As the judge made her decision, I didn't bother looking at Samantha. I didn't care to see her reaction, to hear her plead or cry. As I walked out of the courtroom, I heard her sobbing, saying she only cheated that one time and had been faithful ever since. But I didn't care anymore. I was done. A few weeks later, Samantha called me, furious when she found out I'd stopped all payments for Chloe's private school and extracurriculars. I told her to call her baby daddy and hung up the phone. Even Chloe finally called me, her first time reaching out since this whole nightmare began. She was crying, saying she had to transfer to public school, that they were moving back to the old neighborhood, and how scared she was. She begged me for us to be a family again. I didn't hold back. I told her to go to her real father, the one she clearly wanted more than me. I reminded her that I had read all the texts, the back and forth between her and Samantha, her and my cousin, and how she had been grateful that I wasn't her dad. She'd said it herself, that a hoodlum like me wasn't her father. Even though I hadn't been that person since the day I found out I was going to be a dad. I hung up on her after that. There were times when the pain was so overwhelming that I thought about ending it all. I thought about ending my cousin, too. But instead, I made sure he paid. He ended up having to pay me half a million dollars. Half a million, all mine, and not a single cent went to my ex since she had already agreed to that lump sum alimony. I didn't give a damn that the money came from the church. I was hurting, and the cash felt like the only justice I had. Not long after that, I packed up and left New York behind. I needed to get as far away from that mess as I could. So I randomly picked Idaho. I didn't know anyone, didn't care. I just needed a fresh start. I opened a new auto shop, bought myself a house, but for two long years, I battled trust issues like you wouldn't believe. I went to therapy, sat through anger management, and even spent time in those rage rooms just trying to get all the bottled up anger out of me. It wasn't easy. Eventually, though, I found myself going back to church, of all places. That's where I met Lily. Lily was wonderful. She had just turned 30, and we clicked right away. I told her everything about my past, no holding back. I made it clear I had trust issues, and she understood. She didn't push me. About a year later, she told me she was pregnant, and the first thing she did was insist on a DNA test, just so I could have peace of mind. I can't explain the relief I felt when I got the results. For the first time in years, I remembered what it felt like to be truly happy again. And when my son was born, I was over the moon. I even called my grandmother for the first time in years. She cried when she heard my voice, and when I told her about my son, she insisted I come back to New York so she could meet her great-grandchild. Of course, she laid on the guilt trip, reminding me she was 90 and wanted to see me at least one more time. I caved and agreed. So we flew out to New York, rented a car, and drove back to Bushwick. The thing about going back to the hood is that you only need to run into one person from your past, and suddenly the whole neighborhood knows your back. My grandmother was thrilled to see my son, met Lily, and, of course, made some offhand comment in Spanish about her being white. I just smiled and nodded, trying to ignore it. We planned to stay for a week, do some tourist stuff since it was Lily's first time in the city, and I wanted it to be special. But things never go as planned. Do they? First, I heard someone shouting my name from downstairs. I looked out the window and saw it was Samantha. I hadn't seen her in years, and I was honestly shocked by how much weight she'd gained. My grandmother nudged me, telling me in Spanish to go talk to her, and Lily agreed. I reluctantly went downstairs. It was awkward as hell. For a minute, we just stood there in silence before that old anger started creeping up again. Samantha told me I looked good and admitted she looked like crap. 
She started rambling about how much she missed me, how she hadn't been with another man since our divorce, but I didn't engage. Then she dropped a bomb I was a grandfather. I shot her a look, and she explained that Chloe had gotten pregnant at 18. Apparently, she'd ended up with a decent guy who joined the Marines to support them, but her real father wanted nothing to do with her. All he did was pay child support, but he refused to even acknowledge her. Samantha added that my cousin wasn't a pastor anymore and was working at the Banco Popular just two blocks over. And then, she told me that Chloe named her baby after me. I couldn't handle it anymore. I just turned and started walking away. Samantha begged me to stay, saying Chloe was on her way over to see me, but I couldn't stand it. I headed back upstairs, and the second I walked into my grandmother's place, Lily didn't even need to ask. She knew and we left. In the elevator, I told her what happened, and she smiled, reassuring me that everything would be alright. As we were leaving the building, I noticed Samantha staring at Lily like she was the other woman, and just as calmly as ever, Lily introduced our son to her. I'd like you to meet his biological child, she said. That line was like twisting the knife, but Lily knew my pain, and she wasn't about to let Samantha forget what she'd done. Samantha tried stopping me from leaving, telling me that Chloe regretted what she had done. Lily, always the more level-headed one, told me to make amends to extend an olive branch. So, I gave Samantha my number and said Chloe could call me if she wanted. Then we got into the car and left, but as we were waiting at a red light, I saw my cousin, standing by the Cuchifrito stand. Something snapped inside me. I got out of the car, marched right up to him, and beat the living crap out of him. Lily was screaming at me to stop, and when our eyes met, I could see the fear in her face. That look stopped me in my tracks. I spit on him and walked away. Now, I'm back home, being a dad to my son, working hard, and being the best fiancé I can to a wonderful woman. But ever since that trip back to New York, when I'm alone with my thoughts, the anger comes creeping back in. It's like a shadow I can't escape. Chloe eventually texted me, sending a picture of herself smiling with her son, telling me she was sorry for everything she had done. But honestly, I don't know if she's sorry because she misses me, or if she's just sorry that the man she wanted as her father wasn't who she thought he was. It's so confusing, and I'm terrified to reach out to her. I want to move forward to get past all of this. My family was my entire world, especially my daughter. Even after all these years, it still stings. It still fills me with rage. And yet, I know deep down that I need to move on. But how? It's hard to shake off the pain. Part of me wants to reach out to Chloe, but the fear is crippling. Everyone's telling me to let her back into my life, but all I can think about are those text messages, the lies, the betrayal. It's like the wounds never truly healed. I need help, and all my usual ways of coping just aren't working. It's been a while since I last talked about this, but yesterday was Father's Day. Chloe called me several times. I just stared at my phone, wanting to answer so badly, but I couldn't. All I could think about were those hurtful things she said in her messages, to her mother, to her real father, and even to her friends. So, I ignored the calls. Eventually, I listened to her voicemail. She sounded so cheerful, like everything was fine. She gave a brief, half-hearted apology for what she'd done, but it didn't feel genuine to me. Felt passive, like she was just checking a box. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but it didn't sit right. She mentioned her son and her fiancé, asked me to call her. Simple things, but I got so mad. My grandmother and Lily keep telling me to give her another chance, but when I asked my grandmother if Chloe or Samantha had ever asked about me during the four years I was gone, she told me that Samantha did, constantly, but not Chloe. So now, my mind's twisting this whole thing up. Maybe Chloe just wants me back in her life for her child's sake, to take care of him. Maybe she wants to milk me for money. That thought makes me so angry. Even Samantha has been calling me non-stop, 
and I'm seriously thinking about changing my number just to get some peace. So, I spent most of Father's Day at the gym, pounding the heavy bag, trying to work out my frustration. I've got an appointment with an anger management group today. Maybe someone there can give me a perspective I haven't considered. I sent Chloe a short email, asking one simple question, what do you want? I wasn't expecting the long, multi-paragraph response I got back. She started by apologizing, over and over again, for how she had treated me. She said that when she found out I wasn't her real father, she was angry and confused. She confronted Samantha about it, and her mother broke down crying, begging her to keep it a secret from me. Chloe said that after that, she started feeling lost, and in her confusion, she began turning to my cousin, her biological father, more and more. That's when he began telling her stories about my violent past, the things I used to do before I turned my life around, the things I kept from her. And with each story, her anger towards me grew. As she spent more time with him, she pulled further away from me. She admitted that sometimes she felt guilty, but my cousin would reinforce those negative feelings, driving a bigger wedge between us. On the day of her quinceanera, while we were dancing, she said she started to realize how wrong she had been. She could see, right there in that moment, just how much I loved her. And then those damn text messages showed up on the screen, and everything fell apart. In the days that followed, she wanted to reach out, but her mother's side of the family told her to give me space, to not contact me. So she listened to them, watching as everything around her crumbled, feeling powerless to stop it. She said she understood why I did what I did, why I cut her off, removed my name from her birth certificate, and walked away. Still, she had always wanted to reach out. She told me that her grandfather kept telling her I loved her, that I had raised her, and despite all the hurt I saw in those messages, I would eventually come around. She believed him. During the divorce, she told me Samantha fell into a deep depression. She barely spoke to anyone, stopped eating, and seemed to just exist in a dark place. Chloe said when she found out that my name had been removed from her birth certificate, she had a panic attack. That was the moment she realized just how much damage had been done, and she didn't know how to fix it. Her mother told her they'd have to move back to Brooklyn, and when Chloe asked about her future, her school, her life, her mother coldly replied, that was the life your father gave you, and he's not your father anymore. Desperate, Chloe called me, begging for help, but I cursed her out and hung up. She cried for days after that, completely shattered.